Hi everyone, welcome back once again. We are glad to have you to see you this evening today. Okay, um, if any of your friends or your family are looking at joining us, feel free to invite them to join us now as we are starting the session right away. Um, allow me to introduce myself. I'm Yin Mei from Kunal Futures, uh, Sindhya Bahad, and for information today, today's session is a joint collaboration with CME Group in our effort to create awareness and provide education on listed derivatives to all of you here today. So um, for those who have actually joined us earlier for the session, thank you for being punctual and I believe you have seen some rotating slides of banner prior to I speak now. So if you take note, um, there's actually a banner showing that you can actually earn up to 28% cashback from now till 31st of August 2022, right? This is actually an ongoing campaign um, where if you trade with us on selected micro and e-mini futures contract, contracts, you can actually earn up to 28% cashback. Should you wish to know more about this campaign, please visit our website at www.kenangafutures.com.my. On the main banner above, you can actually click and take a look and understand more. Or if you like to have, if you, if you wish to uh, find, uh, uh, speak to any one of us, feel free to email us at the designated email address given on the website then. Do note that Futures and option trading involves substantial risk due to leverage factor and may not be suitable for all investors. Hence, this webinar is purely for educational purposes. Kananga Futures accept no liability whatsoever for any direct or consequential loss arising from any use of the content of this webinar. So I think all of us here today, all of us here today are keen to hear from our speaker, Mr. David Ng. Allow me to give a brief background about him. He's a full-time proprietary trade trader with Iceberg. Um, previously, he had, he is the head, he had a team of young and dynamic marketing team in one of our established uh, future uh, established company, a top future a top future broker in Malaysia. He graduated from University of Manchester with bachelor degree of economics and social science. With his extensive study research in commodities and indices, which include crude palm oil futures, futures Kuala Lumpur index, and other few major figure, other major futures products. Well, today we have him here with us to speak about navigating the U.S. market on technical analysis and risk risk management setup. So I think we are all ace to 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 hear what has David sh to share with us today here. So, um, David, are you here with us yet? Yeah, hi, hi, Yimi. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you very clearly. How, how's your day going? Is everything good? Yeah, it's good. Uh, just, just a quick uh, sound check and slide check. Are you able to see my slides? I just yes, you can see your slide. And yes, on the main page is risk navigating the US market, technical analysis and risk management setup. So we are okay, all good uh, to roll. And um, so I'll pass the floor over to you. Okay, thank you, Yingmi. Uh, Thanks, uh, thank, thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the wonderful introduction. Um, so just before I start, I'd just like to thank uh, Kananga Futures as well as CME uh, for organizing this webinar entitled uh, The US Market, uh, looking on a perspective of technical analysis and risk management setup. Uh, now, I, I, I think, you know, um, if you have been to some of the webinars which I conducted earlier with Kananga Futures, you have probably known that um, the way I approach uh, any topic or any, uh, you know, um, any markets in general is to look at it in both matters. One is to look at it fundamental perspective, uh, which involves fundamental analysis, whether you are trading commodities or equities, I believe to a certain extent, uh, you know, fundamentals does play a role uh, whenever you, you look at the market. Um, however, I think when it comes to a trader, if you do it on a daily basis, uh, it is even it is very imperative that you must have a setup, a setup of a plan uh, with regards to technical analysis. So uh, the way I'll approach most of the, the product itself or the market itself is actually both ways. Uh, I'll start off with the fundamental uh, analysis of the market itself, and I'll gradually move on to how I'm going to see certain setups that I can use uh, with regards to the technical perspective. Um, so same goes for this webinar. Um, I think whenever you trade the US market, especially you trade the, um, the micro e-minis, which is currently available on CME platform, um, I believe it's a very good product. Um, so, you know, if you are someone new to the U.S. market, uh, you're not being exposed uh, to the market before, I think it's a great, great place to start off with the micro e-minis. Uh, 
uh, which I can touch later on on my, on my slide as well. Um, so just before I start, as usual, uh, with disclaimer, just to reiterate what Nimi has mentioned, I think dealing with futures or any sort of derivative products does involve a lot of risk. So make sure you you do make sure you really have to make your own study uh, before starting your journey in in uh, in this space. Uh, and obviously, I think any um, this webinar is purely for educational purpose. So any comments or any uh, opinions are purely my own it doesn't reflect opinion by Tanangia futures or even by the exchange itself um so i, I think as you know, start the journey uh you know um dabbling with more with information and knowledge that you gain from today's webinar um and obviously you need to make sure you do a lot of homework and research before you gain uh, any exposure in the market now um, so I think these are just a brief agenda for today's uh, session. For the next one hour or so, uh, we're just probably going to cover, you know, um, some of the key aspects in terms of fundamentals, uh, you know, factors that actually can affect the U.S. market. Um, now I, I think is you know I, I get this a lot and I get this question a lot uh, when it comes to you know talking about the market itself. Is that you know it's all this data or reports or even uh, economic view. Is relevant when it comes to trading. Now, when it comes to day to day or even uh, time frame selection, uh, it's, it's pretty much a technical play. But I think fundamental to a certain extent, it does uh, help you to, uh, in a way, create your understanding or helps you to paint a picture of how the economy is going to go. By then, you can create a bias on how you view the technical chart perspective. Um, so I would say that I think fundamental gives you a broader picture, uh, but technical gives you pretty much a frame to frame. Uh, picture of the market. Uh, so that's how I'm going to see it. And I think it's best that we need to have a broader view of where the market is going. Um, so, you know, in, in, in our business as a trader, it's always difficult for us to always be fighting against a trend. If the market is slowing down, the trend is showing you that it's going on a downside, uh, find positions for you to short rather than finding position for you to time for you to long the market. Uh, when the trend is, is with you, right with the trend. So I think that's how we're going to approach it. Uh, and I, I think last but not least, uh, it's important to have a technical plan. Um, so if you uh, are someone new to the market, um, I'm just going to share with you very simple steps you can use uh, to really go and uh, look at the uh, market itself and really to test the strategy out. Um, and I, I think with every plan or every strategy in place, you always must have risk management in place. Uh, without proper risk management, technically, you know, if you are someone new to the market, if you are a new trader, it's very difficult for you to survive in this type of volatile markets. So therefore, I think risk management is very important and it's equally, uh, regardless which market you are approaching, uh, whether it's equities, whether it's commodities, uh, I think risk management is a very key aspect when it comes to uh, trading in general. So um, I think like I mentioned, I think I start off with just giving you a brief overview of how you know, the market is. Um, so obviously, I think this year, you know, uh, we have passed, we have entered into endemic period in, in terms of COVID. Um, so pretty much your global economy is actually on a strong footing. So early this year, I think everyone was actually quite optimistic. Uh, you know, IMF projecting, wow, it's like, you know, they were just saying like probably we will see like, um, you know, strong single digit growth uh, in terms of global economy. Uh, but that narrative actually changed quite fast. Uh, reason being is because we have two major themes. One is obviously inflation. Things are rising, uh, prices are rising. That actually, you know, hampered growth. Uh, and I think second thing is always uh, geopolitical conflict with the Ukraine and Russia conflict. Uh, whenever a geopolitical tension, it's just going to create more fuel, more fire when it comes to inflation because you know things are getting uh, harder to to arrive to destination. You know, logistical issues. Uh, so these are the factors that actually drive prices. So really, I think this year, despite your we are very optimistic in the beginning of the year, but you know, things starts to show starts to slow down as especially when enter the second and third quarter. Um, so I think besides that, you know, we also have a third uh, coming factor, which is also you should be watching very closely, is China. Um, I think China, you look at the news, you look at the, the news print lately, I think they are all painting quite bearish picture in China. Um, so with global economy slowing down, with China is slowing down dr uh, dramatically, I think that's going to create a lot of concern going forward in terms of looking where the economy is going to go. Um, now, surprisingly, I think if you just look at China itself, uh, you know, I think it's the only country so far uh, that is actually cutting rates. The rest of other major countries around the world is actually hiking uh, their interest rates. So China is a very abnormal scenario. I think this is evident that 
I think China's economy is going to slow down. And, you know, China is it's not a small economy. In fact, I think in, in 10 years down or 15 years down the pipeline, probably they'll be the largest economy in the world. Um, so when you have a significant player slowing down, I think that can tell you a lot of narrative of the global economy going forward. Now, uh, if you just look at US uh, market itself, just look at different benchmarks if you compare. Um, obviously, during the COVID uh, pandemic, uh, when it hit us back in March 2020, I think it was very evident that tech counters are the really the booming counters uh, in the US economy. Um, I think in pretty much across the world as well, uh, because with, with people staying locked down at home, you know, the demand for technology, the demand for tech, uh, it is substantial. And I think therefore, I think tech sectors actually benefited a lot. If you just look at NASDAQ itself, we just look at this chart that I just painted. Uh, you know, the NASDAQ, I think, is one of the best performing benchmarks as compared to other major benchmarks in the US. Uh, it outperformed um, your S&P, it outperformed Dow Jones, and it outperformed Russell 2000. So what this goes to show is that I think NASDAQ itself, um, you know, when you trade, um, when you trade the micro futures contract, there's a lot of benchmark that you can choose. Uh, but choosing NASDAQ itself, given that it's an outperforming index, uh, when market really adjusts, you adjust quite drastically. So this goes to tell you that you have to be careful whenever you're choosing certain benchmark contracts to trade. Make sure that you must understand the volatility of the market, the benchmark itself. Uh, NASDAQ is very tech heavy. So you no know, tech heavy are very, they are sensitive to earnings, they are sensitive to market developments or especially economy developments. Um, so when this counter get a hit, uh, normally the price will tend to, to be quite volatile. Um, so true enough, if you look at it, uh, NASDAQ has actually been, been quite a volatile uh, benchmark itself relatively to other benchmark. Uh, but I think overall, you look at a trend. I think since March 2020, we have seen major recovery in across all major, uh, major bench, US benchmarks. Um, the key question is whether is this recovery going to sustain, uh, especially when it hit into second half or even uh, first quarter next year. So I think this is something for us to pay attention to and to be closely watching as well. Now, um, I'm not sure some of the audience here, you invest in uh, US stocks, but if, if that's the case, uh, you'll be probably noticing that you know, uh, during, the, during the COVID era, you know, we really saw that pretty much there's growth across all tech companies, regardless whether you are investing into Meta, which is known as Facebook, or Microsoft, or Amazon, or Alphabet, all these counters was actually seeing significant rally. Uh, but coming this year into 2022, things start to change differently. If you notice that um, you know, tech counters, although they, they are still rallying, but the strength, the growth, or momentum of such a, the pace is actually slowing down. Um, so again, these are all depending on, you know, if you're investing in stocks, you probably will know, you know, when earnings of the company starts to slow down, whether it's economic factor, whether it's business factor, normally the price will have to adjust. Uh, and once prices of these major tech counters starts to adjust, it will actually affect the index or the benchmark itself. Now, this is, um, I want to point this chart to you. So just to show you and highlight uh, why is it important for us to understand the companies that's under, underlying a particular benchmark? Um, so the reason I say Nasdaq has been outperforming is because uh, I think 2020 was really the team uh, for tech counters, but that has changed. Uh, I think 2022, you no, know, really we are seeing a lot of significant ch uh, change in the dynamics of the economy. Um, so if you just look at earnings per se, some of the, these tech companies like the used to call, used, used to call fan counters, um, really see significant uh, you know, decline in their earnings growth, especially in Netflix and a few other uh, you know, uh, tech companies. Now, if this trend continue, that tells you that I think Jenny, it paints that the economy itself is actually slowing down in certain ways. Um, and with these tech companies that are so heavy, uh, it actually will affect the NASDAQ index itself. Um, so if you just look at the projection itself, I think going to 2022, that's why I say second half is interesting to watch. Uh, it's going to be quite a volatile period. Um, you know, with earnings of these top tech companies are actually showing you this decline uh, in terms of their momentum. They are still making earnings, but their earning pace is slowing down. Now, when it comes to surprises, this is where it gets interesting. Um, you know, a lot of people will always look at, you know, if you're trading the US market, they like to look at company earning surprises. If the company earning surprises is positive, normally prices will, will tend to have a big jump. Um, now. We always track, you know, 
as a trader, if you are trading a US market, uh, we like to know the breadth of the market. I know this kind of information is, is very hard to gather when, when you're trading on the local scene. But if you're trading a US market, a lot of this data is actually available to you. Um, I, I know it's, it's, it's kind of quite hefty to sift through the data, but you know, just understanding this data has actually created quite a lot of relevance when it, when it comes to trade, uh, when it comes to creating a view. Um, so positive surprises in a way that you know, it tracks how many of these companies that is listed on the US market uh, actually come up with positive surprises. Of course, as the ratio goes higher, that means more companies are giving more positive earning surprises. But when those ratios starts to go down, that indicates that generally the mark, um, some companies maybe maybe earnings are quite estimated as uh, as what is being estimated by the market. Um, some even be negative surprises. So it's interesting to watch. Um, in fact, if you look at it, whenever you see positive earnings surprises starts to come down, normally indicates that you know generally the economy is not going to go too good. And true enough, we just look at a few episodes in 2020. We saw obviously with COVID-19 hit us. Um, you know, we saw a lot of, uh, we saw a, a decline in ratio of these positive earnings surprises. So I think it's a very good gauge uh, and it's a good indication for us to really roughly gauge where the market is going to hit uh, for the foreseeable quarters. Now, you know, when you look at US markets, we're trading equities, you are looking at different sectors that's actually, uh, you know, um, out there in the market. Um, I think last year, if you just look at it, how the rally that we see in energy prices, obviously the energy sector is the one that's benefiting the most. Um, the rest of the other economies are still recovering. Uh, you know, a lot of countries last year were still pretty much in lockdown. Uh, and I think only this year we slowly transitioned to an endemic where you know, countries are slowly reopening. Um, so therefore sectors uh, like consumer services, like discretionary, these are the sectors that's actually starting to see growth. Um, so if you just look at it, I think, on a monthly basis, uh, the team is really going into consumer. So as long as economy is, is growing, they see uh, a lot of fund managers out there they think that consumers is the one that will definitely be benefiting uh, con consumer sectors and consumer discretionary. So it's very evident. If you just look at it, um, you know, if you start to see growth in all these different segments uh, of the economy that ties to consumer spending. Uh, but I think the key thing we have to watch out is these numbers that we're seeing is month to date is still very marginal. You are talking about three to five percent increment. That's nothing much to shout about. Um, you know, if just compared to year to date, they are still down deep. Uh, especially consumer services and discretionary sectors, they are down like almost twenty to thirty percent year to date. Um, obviously, on a money basis, they do see some gains, but the gains are not uh, not something to be measurable enough. Um, so. I think this goes to tell you, despite you are seeing earnings starting to come in, but earnings surprises starts to decline, uh, you know, really I think it goes to show you know, how long can a sector last, especially when the economy that's slowing down. So these are some key stats that is worth to pay a bit more attention to, because as economy starts to gradually slow down, it's very evident when it comes to looking into a specific sectors and in terms of their growth. Now, um, so that's in terms of the sectoral itself. You just look at how the economy as a whole uh, is interesting enough. I think this year, you know, we, we are facing an economy that is, is gradually people are seeing a peak. Um, you know, economic activities are in fact uh, showing you signs of weaknesses. Uh, but central banks, on the other hand, is going on an aggressive hike. Um, I think be it whether it's in US or even in UK, uh, these are the countries that's actually aggressively tightening their of monetary policy by hiking interest rates. Now, I just show you this map. You just notice that you know there's one area that is still quite blue. Uh, in fact, two major countries as that's having a blue area, blue region. That means these are the countries that didn't hike rates, but in fact they actually uh, reduce their interest rates. Um, I think China is a rare exception. I think China so far is the only country that's actually been reducing their um, interest rate, while the rest of the other countries around the world is actually on an aggressive path. Um, Russia is the only one that is not doing anything. I think they're benefiting a lot from uh, the trade surpluses that they're enjoying right now. So China is a very oddball. Um, and I think going forward, it's, it's getting very interesting as if you look at it in terms of the broader economy uh, perspective. Uh, we have major countries like US and UK aggressively tightening their, their rates. Uh, but you have China, on the other hand, trying to counter that by reducing their interest rates. Now. You probably have known we have we have been in a 
period where we have sustained a low interest rate environment. Now we are starting to feel the pinch because uh, rates are starting to come off. Uh, but China, on the other hand, you know, I think when, whenever you reduce your interest rates, that tells you or that signals to the economy that you know things are not looking that good. Uh, so therefore, I'm going to put a bit more stimulus. So I think that's how uh, we, we are seeing in China. I think that's also going to be quite um, something to watch out for in terms of development. And it's going to create uh, quite a lot of volatile markets uh, with all these policy measures. Now, um, I think the reason why central banks has been so aggressively tight, um, tightening their belts, you know, hiking interest rate is actually to rein in on inflation. Um, obviously, inflation is a major theme this year. Uh, be it whether in, in the global front or even in the local perspective, you're also feeling the heat. Um, but really, I think inflation is, is really, you know, something that is, is bothering a lot of central bankers. Um, if you just look at US itself, you know, you're talking about double digit, uh, you know, CPI levels, uh, which is massive. If you compare to where their, you know, their US strategy rates is only talking about 2%, uh, but your CPI is almost approaching 9%, you're talking a big gap over there. Um, so really, I think there's a lot of room uh, for Federal Reserve to really high interest rate to cover the gap. Uh, but obviously, there is a cost. Whenever you high interest rates, there is always a negative impact on other parts of the economy. And one is obviously, you know, um, you know your debt cost, your debt servicing, uh, and to a certain extent, even you can slow down the economy uh, too much that you can create a negative growth environment, uh, which is ultimately caused stagflation. Um, but I think nevertheless, you know, it, it is, I, I think Federal Reserve will have to act in such a manner because the inflation level is just too high at the point in time. Um, now, if you just look at employment cost itself, it's also rising. Um, so really, I think that's, that's also a cause of concern. So why is this important? Um, now, central bankers are watching the inflation numbers very closely. Um, so in fact, when US publish month-to-month uh, -month CPI change, that is the date that if you're trading the market, you have to be very careful. Um, I think just like last month, we saw the CPI print uh, for the first time, it actually went uh, lower than expected. Uh, so there's, uh, there's market a ticket as a sign that you know, probably inflation might reach a peak or slowing down. Um, if you ask me you know, whether this uh, slowdown we are seeing in the last month's print uh, is indicating a peak, probably it's too early. You, know? um, you look at natural gas prices, you look at crude oil, they're still quite elevated. So, you know, to call it a peak is still too early. You still need to wait a couple of months. Um, but why, why is this significant? You know, if you're trading a market, watch out on CPI number days because right now the market is very sensitive. As long as inflation shows you there's no sign of easing, uh, really, I think that's where it's, markets going to be very volatile during the CPI, uh, you know, uh, days. Um, now, so... I mean, just to share with, I mean, just to show you, I think if you just look at interest rate perspective, um, I just got this from Bloomberg. You really can see that, you know, uh, things are looking up quite uh, in terms of rates. I think Federal Reserve is still will continue to hike at least for the foreseeable meetings. Um, I think right until first quarter next year. Um, now, what's interesting is this. If you just look at second or probably third quarter next year, rates starts to come off. And we just look at what they are implying on the interest rate. When you say implied, means this is what they are foreseeing or ex expecting to achieve. Uh, they are probably looking at about 3.5 to probably about 4% as totality in terms of the rates uh, by Federal Reserve. Uh, right now, they are doing about 2.25. So that means you need to leave a room of 100 basis point max or 150. Um, so it goes to say, I think probably in the next two or three meetings, we might see that Either rates will be maintained or rates will come down. When rates starts to come down, normally market will take it quite positively. Uh, that means I think you know generally the, the debt servicing cost is lower. Uh, market will generally be quite happy when rates are coming down. So I'm not saying that you know uh, market in the next six months or so, uh, once interest rate is peak uh, and it starts to come down, that's where I start to see rally in the market. Now you must understand the dynamics of the market recently has changed a lot. Uh, nowadays, to a certain extent, that you know, when things are looking, when when prints are, or rather, when data is pointing you negatively uh, on a negative front, uh, market tends to take it as a bullish view, and vice versa. So I think that's where, as a trader, you have to be very sensitive, and that's where risk management comes into place. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's important for us to get an understanding of where 
you know, how the market dynamics is changing as we go forward. Um, so again, I think this will reiterate the point whereby if you just look at it, Federal Reserve looks like it's going to be tapering off their rates, uh, even in fact as early as uh, second quarter next year. Uh, and I think if you just look at a normal rate, they are probably expecting rates to probably reach 3.5 max or 4%, which is the highest. Um, they don't see anything that's beyond 4%. Um, so this is assuming that by 3.5%, um, that's the rate that they think that it can bring down inflation level to probably back to 2 or 3%. Um, whether this is achievable, I think this is a million dollar question. Uh, you know, and how they come up with 3.5 or 4% is pretty much a consensus view. Uh, ultimately, things can change. But what's important to take note is that um, I think it's just going to be a, another two or three more hikes, and I think market will be quite neutral by then. Um, so watch out. I think market is going to be very attentive to you know, this kind of uh, rate, uh, high interest rates or even in a reduction in interest rate because uh, market is now looking at interest rate as a prime mover uh, for any market action. Um, now, I think I just got this piece from Bloomberg. I think it's very good to, to point it out to, to the audience. I think what this tells you is that, um, I think based on this author, it, it, it says that, you know, things has changed. Um, a lot of people draw the comparison right now, especially in the US market. Um, when you have high inflation level, back in the 1970s, we have the walk, uh, Paul Walker, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve at that time, you know, it was the way he reined in inflation is to hike interest rate as high as to more than ten percent. Um, now, I think environment of the economy has changed dramatically. Um, obviously, in, in early two thousand, we have globalization. Things are more uh, intertwined with uh, a lot of different factors. Um, so, whether you know, uh, if you look back on historical perspective, um, you know, for us to reach three point five or four percent of interest rate perspective is is quite easy to achieve. But what, when things starts to go down south, and if we really have to cut rates, um, I think what these authors were saying is that if we enter into a recession or probably the or worse than a recession uh, or severe recession, I think it take more than at least more than three point five or four uh, percent in terms of interest rate cut. Now I think that's kind of true in a sense that you know um, now I think it requires a lot of action by the Federal Reserve to. You know, if anything were to go wrong, if they want to cut interest rates, they have to go very deep cut. Um, and I, I think you know, the faster they increase their interest rates, the faster they have the room to cut. Um, now, I think the opinion piece by this says that you know, one way to counter this, if you, don't, if you don't have much room to cut interest rate, is to probably change your targets. Um, I think that's quite a good way of looking at it. You know, um, Federal Reserve always says that you know, inflation level should be at 2%. So why not raise it to 3%? That gives you a bit more room for you to target inflation. Um, now, I think this is feasible. Um, but what this tells you is that, you know, um, I think rate cuts by central banks um, is going to be quite a sensitive uh, topic going forward. Uh, and I think if you are watching the market, this is something for us to really pay attention to, especially when it comes to FOMC meetings. Um, I think these are some of the areas that a lot of you know, traders will be looking at very closely. Now. Um, coming into that, I think you know a lot of if you just based on the technical definition of recession, I think U.S. is actually in a technical recession. Uh, but if you just look at the minutes by FOMC, it clearly states that you know if you look at other data, you know it seems to suggest that the economy still have room to grow, uh, and in fact, it's actually uh, not in a recession in terms of economy pers uh, economy perspective, but in terms of technical definition, indeed they are. Um, but if you look closely into certain variables, it's actually quite clear cut that um, there's, there's a lot of indication that the economy is in fact slowing down quite dramatically. Um, firstly, you have the condition, business conditions. Whenever we have um, you know, negative numbers, that tells you generally people are quite skeptical. Um, now, what I have here, just look at Empire State uh, Condition Index, uh, which is a survey done by some of the business uh, states area. You can clearly see that you know, the levels are negative, which quite coincide back in 2008 financial crisis. During that time, we recorded those numbers, um, and also obviously during the pandemic, uh, COVID pandemic time. Um, so I think conditions are getting tighter, business are feeling the pain, and uh, with rising inflation, I think that's going to be a pain point. Um, secondly, I think you look at 
some of the house um, home builder index. Uh, if you look at housing stats in US, they are also telling you that the picture is quite grim in the sense that if you just look at um, the survey numbers is showing you uh, going below 50. Um, normally, you no. Know, if you just look at the past historical, whenever the index cross below 50, that tells you generally the economy is going to hit into major uh, slowdown. Now, what's funny is that if you just look at uh, this index itself, the Home Builders Survey, uh, back in 2008, global financial crisis, just before the start of the GFC, you notice that the index is already way below 50 during that time. And it was back in, uh, I think it was mid of 2007 or later part of 2007. Uh, now, it went to as low as 20. That's where it's, it's a clear sign. And true enough, I think later on, three months later, um, you know, the whole global economy went into a deep recession. Now, um, we are not in similar levels. We are still you know, above the tech line, above 50. But what is uh, critical is that the trend is showing you there's, there's a sluggish pace in the uh, home market in US. Uh, and these are all clear kinds, clear signs that, you know, Jenny, I think when people are not so optimistic, um, they are quite pessimistic in nature. This is where it is quite reflected upon in some of these uh, index or benchmarks. Now, um, this is another, I, I would say it's, um, it's a mixture of indication of indicators, economic indicators that's quite widely used. Um, I think a lot of fund managers in the US, they look at this. Um, this is what we call a US conference board top 10 leading indicators. So they mix uh, indicators from the job market, uh, from the business market, uh, even from the policy perspective. Uh, and they do combine and, and to create an index itself. So if you notice that every time when the, the index breach below the zero mark, normally it tells you generally the, the business or economic conditions are not favorable. Uh, and true enough, we just look at historically uh, speaking, every time when it hit below zero mark, uh, normally it entails a recession that is as ensuing. So the key question is that I think the index just breached the zero mark just a couple of weeks back. Um, so really, are we going to see a, a, a dramatic, a drastically recession that's coming in play? Um, I think as long as the economic indication is showing you a persist, persistent sign of sluggishness, I think that's where recession is very likely. Now, I think besides home sales, another key area to look at is vehicle sales. Um, I know there's always a hype about looking at vehicle sales. Um, just last year, if you notice or read the news, um, you know, second cars goes for as high as, as uh, two or three times compared to pre-COVID uh, level. Uh, and I think that has significantly tapered off uh, just early part of this year. In fact, I think the index right now is actually trading uh, just right to pre-COVID levels. Um, now, it's, it's not a matter of whether are we reaching uh, pre-COVID levels or even, even, in fact, lower than that. What's important is that all these tests are telling you that there is significant, significant uh, downturn in a particular area. And what is important is that as long as uh, it's creating a big impact, eventually it will translate into other uh, indicators as well or other parts of the economy. So I think these are all telltale signs that is worth watching out. Um, now, I think this is quite interesting. If you compare the U.S. inflation over the years back in the 1980s, this is where I mentioned earlier, um, there was a very steep uh, inflation levels in the U.S. Um, and if you compare to the GDP, you notice one thing that's very evident is that whenever you have high inflation levels, um, normally you have a very bad GDP number. And true enough, if you look at it, um, you know, over the years, when you have high inflation environment, normally GDP will be affected. Um, so if you just look at this um, relationship itself, whether it holds in the future, um, you know, historical is, is still a matter of, of, of basis of a guide. You can't really use it uh, as a way to predict the future, but it serves as a, quite a good guide. Um, so right now you have this, what you have is you have a high uh, U.S. inflation in, uh, number and the U.S. GDP is actually declining. Um, so I think this is going to be a cause of concern. I think that's where, you know, Federal Reserve is very persistent on hiking interest rate just to contain inflation. Um, because if they don't do that, I think generally the GDP numbers will be badly affected. Um, so I think this is uh, one good relationship that we can look at, especially when you when you're watching the US market. Um, so I think this, just to show you certain variables that is worth to pay close attention to, 
um, it's really, I think, markets, a lot of indicators are showing you that generally the market is slowing down um, and I think certain indicators are pointing you that the market is actually heading into a recession. So you just look at this one as well. Uh, what we have here is a 10 minus the two years treasury. Um, so normally when you're inversion, whereby the two years is trading much higher than the 10 years, um, that indicates that given six months later, the economy itself will enter into recession uh, based on the historical perspective. So right now, I think there's a bit of inversion in this uh, yield curve. Um, so that's already pointing you that possibly the, the market itself is actually in a recession uh, by any means. So I think really these are some of the key things that we really need to look at uh, when it comes to gauging the US economy. Now, um, I'm, going to go, I'm not going to go too deep on inflation. Um, so despite we are seeing the month-to-month -month figures uh, decline last month, uh, but what's important is that if you just discount some of the uh, irrelevant or you know, consumer spendings are very different. So CPI numbers sometimes may give you a different picture. But if you just look at some of the key uh, areas where consumers spend and the price of those uh, goods itself, it didn't really decline. In fact, it actually uh, went higher. So these are something that we really have to watch out for. Um, so the question is, will inflation peak or when will inflation peak? Really, you have to watch out on a lot of matrix. And one is obviously, you know, um, energy prices. As long as energy prices are not coming down fast enough, um, I think that's where inflation risk is, is going to be very uh, elevated. Uh, but obviously, when energy prices starts to decline, I think that's where we start to see some a bit of easing in inflation levels. Um, so again, these are all correlating to what the government going to, what the central bank is going to do. Uh, you have high inflation, definitely they're going to be hiking interest rates to control the inflation. So again, I think this is um, this is energy prices this year is crazy. Um, if you just look at the UK gas prices. I think it's, it's historical high. Um, obviously, the US gas prices has actually declined uh, quite tremendously. Uh, but still, if you compare years back uh, to pre-COVID levels, or in fact, the last two years, um, levels are still dramatically very significant. So this tells you, you know, you want inflation to come down, you really need gas prices to start coming down. Because generally, a lot of consumer, in fact, uh, if you just look at, on average, the consumer spends about 10 to 20% of their salary on gas prices. So if gas prices are not coming down, it's very difficult for, uh, for the overall inflation level to come down. Now, um, what is interesting in this chart is if you compare inflation against the Dow Jones performance, um, you can clearly see that generally when you have a low inflationary environment, it's quite beneficial for the stock market um, over the years. Uh, now, things start to change, obviously, in 2021, uh, 2022, uh, when inflation starts to rise rapidly. Um, so I think the market itself was still quite euphoric uh, because you know, rates are still quite cheap. Uh, but when central banks start to rein in inflation, they start hiking interest rate, stock market starts to react. Um, now, again, I mentioned these are all historical relationships, whether it is. It, it can be true for the foreseeable future. Um, it, it may not be that basis. But what's important to take note is that inflation is going to be very high. Interest rate is definitely going to be uh, going higher because as a way to counter the inflation effect, um, the key question is, will people really jump into the equity bandwagon? Um, you can clearly see there's a divergence in the sense that when you have high inflation numbers, uh, stock markets tend not to perform. I think that's where uh, we really need to look at uh, this relationship in pair. Now, um, I, I, as I mentioned, I think inflation is a key concern for central bankers. Um, but I, I think one area that also the central bank is looking at, uh, they will continue to hike interest rate as long as also the employment numbers remain healthy. If you just look at the numbers itself, uh, it looks like unemployment is, is still quite healthy in a sense. Uh, but watch out on the jobless claims. As long as the jobless claims starts to rise, um, it tells you that generally the economy is also slowing down. So it's a balance. Central bank is actually on a very tight rope. Uh, on one hand, you have to hike interest rate as fast to rein in inflation. On the other hand, you have to make sure that the, mark, that the job market itself doesn't collapse. Um, because when you hike interest rates, businesses suffer because the debts they have, they have to pay much more now. 
Um, so they have to make sure that the jobless uh, claims uh, remain quite neutral. Uh, if it does inch higher uh, and they are quite comfortable with it, I think they will still continue to hide until where they reach a level where I think that will feel the impact uh, when employment numbers starts to go up. So these are all the dynamics of the market. And I think this is what the central banks in the US are facing right now. Um, and it's not only limited to the US market. In fact, uh, other major markets are also uh, in a way affected by such dynamics. Now, um, I'm not going to go too deep on, on some of these uh, major indicators, but it all points down to, it all concludes to one direction that the, generally the US economy is, is in fact slowing down. Um, may, I think you must understand the US economy comprises a lot of consumer spending. Uh, and as long as consumers are optimistic, generally the economy will be growing. But when consumers are starting to back down, especially when consumers start to spend less, you know, job look claims are getting higher, and obviously home sales are not coming in because interest rates are rising, mortgage rates are also rising. So if consumers are, you know, they want to be more careful, they tend not to spend. Um, and true enough, I think you look at some of the housing sales in the US, they start to come down quite dramatically, especially with the high interest rate. Um, I think they start to notice that, you know, uh, repayment, uh, repayment cost is going to get a bit more, it's going to get a bit higher going forward. So I think a lot of, consumers are actually quite pessimistic in the sense that they may not be willing to spend as much as compared to the last two years where they get a lot of benefit from the government uh, to spend uh, uh, in goods or even in, in, uh, in the housing sector. Now, um, so I think that's pretty much on the consumer end. Um, just want to touch a little bit on the manufacturing output. So it's not only consumer that's feeling the pinch, like I mentioned the businesses are also feeling the pinch. Um, so really you can clearly see um, we can't really compare um, the numbers back in 2008. Uh, we can't draw that kind of parallel because, uh, you know, again, we are in different condition. Uh, 2008 was a global financial crisis. What you are facing right now is a health crisis, and obviously we have a geopolitical factor. Um, so, but again, the numbers doesn't, uh, doesn't look good. It tells you that generally a lot of manufacturing activities actually start to slow down. Um, if you just look at US PMI numbers, which is a good barometer of how the U.S. manufacturing is doing uh, is also showing you indication that you know things are also starting to look on the lower end. Now, um, I have this interesting chart in the sense that you know just to give you a, a pretty much like a, a narrative on you know how the U.S. market uh, actually rallied during the pandemic uh, time. Um, if you just look at it, what I have here is the margin debt um, for a lot of the U.S. consumer when it comes to uh, margin. Uh, to finance stock purchases. Um, so obviously when the market is good, a lot of consumers will go into the stock market either with a big debt uh, for the fact that you must understand, you know, uh, debt is cheap um, before the interest rate uh, was being hiked. Um, so obviously a lot of consumers went into the stock market to purchase stocks. Um, there's a lot of leveraging impact. Uh, but if you just look at it, uh, margin financing has started to slow down dramatically, especially during the first quarter this year. That's coinciding with Federal Reserve high interest rates. Um, so obviously, with interest rate costs starting to go higher right now, um, there's a lot of deleveraging that's happening. Consumer is more reluctant to take up debt to buy stocks. So in a sense that, Jenny, if you look at this momentum, uh, when consumers are not participating much in the stock market, uh, you can clearly see that the market in fact, was actually deleveraging. So you can clearly see there's a, there's a downturn in terms of the index itself. Um, it's an interesting uh, picture to look at. Um, as long as margin debts continue to decline, um, it tells you a lot on where the market is going to hit. Um, because a lot of these consumers, um, during those times when debts are cheap, uh, they actually power into the stock market. Um, but now things start to look different. It's no longer cheap for you to be uh, leveraging on the stock market. Um, so I think therefore, you know, uh, in fact, the downturns actually taper off, uh, with, coinciding with the high in, in the interest rate. Now, another thing is that to worth to take note is that, um, you know, if you just look at the wonderful thing about trading the U.S. market in the sense that you have a lot of data and the data is very transparent. Um, if you trade futures market, um, there's always this CFTC report which published on a weekly basis. It tells you how many people are net short, uh, net short or net long in the particular market. Now, when you have a market that is uh, obviously a, a very strong 
uh, or very high position that is holding long. Generally, the, if the trend is up, generally the trend is very healthy. Uh, but what happens if you have, right now we are seeing that the gen, if you just look at the last couple of days, the market actually did a, a bit of a rally. Uh, but the thing is that the net short position in the market has actually increased. So what this tells you is that the rally that we are seeing right now, it could be what we call a bear, uh, a bear market rally. Uh, you know, potentially this rally, they were, the short term rally they are seeing, it could not last. Um, so really, I think these are some telltale signs that, you know, um, it tells you the sentiment of the market is still quite bearish. Uh, but one thing to take note of, when you have a high level of net short position in the market, um, generally you get backfired. Uh, and when this net short position starts to cover, normally we, we start to see quite a big rally in, especially during a bear market. Um, so these are some of the dynamics that is worth to take note. Uh, if you are someone trading a futures market, um, it's good to have a view of, of where the sentiment on the market is by looking at the net positions. Um, now, I think that's pretty much on the economic point of view. Um, obviously, the next part is looking at the sentiment. Um, I think it's good to gauge where the market sentiment is. Uh, if you are trading the market, having a sentiment or, or a gauge or a feeling of the market uh, participants is actually quite a good barometer. If the market participants are generally quite bullish uh, and if you are hitting an uptrend, um, generally the uptrend might last. But if you are entering a downtrend uh, in the market and market participants are bearish, uh, normally it tells you that you know the downtrend possibly can last a bit longer. Um, so right now, if you just look at sentiment-wise, uh, in fact, we've, we've seen a big rally back in late 2020. That is coinciding with a lot of major rally in the benchmark. Uh, but I, once we hit uh, the peak of, uh, I think it was early part of 2021, the confidence index just plunged. Um, I think it went to as low, the index went to as low as, um, again, if compared, relatively speaking, it was as close as to GFC times. Um, it went to as low as 50 on the reading. Um, again, you know, sentiments is turning bearish, uh, market is also turning bearish. So this tells you where generally the market participants are feeling uh, with regards to the market. Now this is uh, AI survey, which is so published on a weekly basis. Uh, what this is interesting is that normally if you look at it, you know, if you have a bullish market, gen if everyone is bullish in the market, generally the market will, will, be, will, will actually see a decline. Um, why is it so? Really, it's a sentiment of the market. If market tends to uh, be sided on a one-sided uh, view, generally how the market perform will, will quite be the opposite. Um, I mean, it's in a way, market in a sense is, is looking at crowd psychology. If there's too many people on one camp, uh, no, uh, they tend to have a lot of concentration trade. Uh, and when things start to unwind, everybody will jump into unwinding their position. So that will create a lot of force uh, rally into a particular position. Um, so right now, the market, if you just look at the sentiment in the market, it's still quite neutral. And neutral journey is, is neither bullish or bearish, uh, but you know, again, it's telling you the market has no proper direction at this point in time. Um, now, this AI reading actually went to the lowest just a couple of weeks back uh, when, the, when Dow Jones actually uh, fall, I think, uh, from 36,000 to 33,000. Um, so I think it was quite a good indication that market was actually very fearful. Uh, but that has changed over the weeks. Uh, in fact, I think the sentiments has improved uh, over, the, over the weeks or so. Um, so it's a good indication, again, for looking at the sentiment of market. And it's helpful, especially when you are looking at the trend of market. Uh, as long as if you're looking at the rally, the trend of market is, is uh, rallying and you need to have a good sentiment to back it up. If you don't have that, I think it's, it's, the rally is, is, is riding on a very uh, weak support. Now, um, I think sentiments are still, still despite being bearish, um, I think just last month reading is showing you a bit of, uh, things are starting to look a bit more slightly positive side. Uh, but again, I think the picture may not last. If you just look at the economic, uh, some of the economic, key economic indicators is pointing you that the market still has a bit more room to go down further. So I think this is something that we have to be very careful of. Now, um, I just want to point you this chart. Uh, what I have here is to look at the dollar index, which is the, uh, the strength of the dollar uh, against uh, your Dow Jones performance. You can, uh, if you just look at it, when you have a strong dollar environment, um, normally it may not be very healthy for the Dow Jones market. 
Um, so that's what you're seeing right now. You see the the, uh, the dollar strengthening massively against other major currencies. Um, I think that's also causing a bit of a weakness when it comes to the equities market. Uh, keeping in mind, when you have strong uh, dollar, you know, generally it's not healthy in terms of exports. Businesses will find it there's a lot of uh, inflation that's, that's concerning in terms of their input costs. Um, so generally, their earnings will be slightly on the downside. Um, so that will create impact onto your index. So keep in mind, uh, again, whether this relationship holds, um, you know, it's, it's much to be seen. Uh, but again, I think dollar might have an impact uh, whenever you look at Dow Jones. Now, um, another, I think, key indicator of the market in terms of sentiment wise is to look at the VIX index. Uh, VIX is a very interesting uh, indicator, especially when you look at uh, sentiment or fear of the market. Um, generally, when you have high VIX index, that tells you uh, the market tend to be on the downside. Um, it happens back in during the COVID uh, season. I think the, in, the VIX index itself went as high as 60 points. Uh, and I think market plunges uh, almost 20% or 30% um, correction in the market. Um, so right now, you know, VIX usually trades between uh, 15 to 20 points. Anything above 20 points, that tells you the market is a bit more fearful. Uh, and when markets are a bit more fearful, that's where if you're trading the Dow Jones market or any other benchmark index, you have to be a bit more careful as well. Uh, because VIX doesn't only signify fear, it also tells you the volatility of the market. Uh, when VIX starts to increase, that tells you generally the market is going to be more volatile. And that's where you really need to be careful uh, if you are trading the market. Now, um, another interesting perspective is to just, just to highlight to the audience is if you look at South Korea exports and the Dow Jones index, I know there's, there's not much of relevance here, but uh, it's interesting to take note that uh, it, it shows quite a strong uh, positive parallel, which means that as long as South Korea exports starts to uh, start to see strength, you can generally expect Dow Jones to also show some strength. Uh, why is, how is it linked is, is in a way, you know, South Korea exports are very uh, tech-oriented. Tech um, so as long as the global economy is growing, they demand a lot of uh, tech products, and in a way, South Korea exports will gain. Uh, and in a sense that, you know, generally, U.S. is a major importer of uh, South Korea products. Um, so that tells you that the economy in the U.S. is also growing. Um, but when that starts to slow down, I think that tells you that generally the Dow Jones market is probably going to head into uh, further downside. So right now, I think South Korea exports, I, I think last month they recorded uh, lower than uh, the previous month. So I think that tells, uh, that was also coinciding with the decline in the Dow Jones market. Again, whether this relationship holds uh, is really much to be seen in the next couple of quarters. Uh, but it's a very good parallel that we can draw, especially when you look at how uh, interlink is. Uh, Dow Jones market with other markets as well. Now, um, I, I think China itself, I'm not going to go too much on China perspective, um, well, since this is more on the US market, uh, but was, it's worth to take note that I think China you know, um, is indeed slowing down. And I think like I mentioned in the earlier slide, uh, it's the only country that in the world that is um, no, not increasing interest rates and in fact cutting their rates. Um, so it's interesting to watch. Um, you know, if China property crisis is not handled well, I think we have a lot of volatility in the market. And as a trader, we love volatility. Um, you know, we, uh, sideways markets tend to be a bit more uh, difficult if you're a trend trader. Um, so when you have a, if a volatile period market, uh, it tends to be quite beneficial for, for trading the market. Um, so I'm, I'm going, not going to go too much on China. Um, so I'm just going to focus on the technical perspective. Now, um, to trade the U.S. market, um, is first thing we, we really need to know is to establish a trend. Now, there's a lot of ways for you to establish a trend of the market. Uh, whether it's an uptrend, downtrend, uh, you know, or sideways market, you can look at it by visually. You know, visually, it's very simple, simple to establish. If you have a market where the highs are getting higher, the lows are getting higher, generally, the market is uptrend. Uh, and in the downtrend market, if the highs of the day is getting lower each day and the lowers are also getting lower, then technically you're looking at a downtrend in the market. Sideways, obviously the high and lows, you can't really determine whether it's higher or lower uh, and pretty much it's, it's in a range. Um, now that's usually depicting a trend. Another way to look at the market trends to use of EMA, uh, exponential moving average, 
uh, in use a 200 period EMA. 200 period EMA is pretty much about six months worth of data, uh, six to eight months. So I think it's actually quite, um, quite sufficient enough. Um, and if you just look at how the market, uh, generally how the market participants look at the trend, uh, whether the market is uptrend or downtrend, it's also looking at a 200 EMA, uh, period EMA. So a lot of people are actually using this. Um, so one way to establish is that as long as the prices are trading above the 200 period EMA, uh, that tells you generally the market is on the uptrend. Uh, and once the 200, once prices trade below the 200 period EMA, uh, that generally tells you the market is actually trading on a downtrend. Now it's interesting to watch the downturns itself. It's uh, it traded below the 200 period EMA back in early April. Uh, so that generally that was technically a downtrend. Uh, it tried to break up. 200 period EMA but it failed uh, and I think just a couple of days back uh, it tried to retest again uh, and just yesterday uh, down Jones actually uh, or the day before it's actually down by 600 points technically it brings it back down to below the 200 period EMA um, so this 200 period EMA line is not only uh, seen as a way to differentiate whether the market is uptrend or downtrend uh, it's also uh, giving you a point where you know it the market usually uh, find this as an area of resistance and support. Um, so right now, generally, if you just look at it based on the latest uh, uh, market data, I think the market is trading below 200 period EMA, which tells you that the market journey is quite a bearish uh, scenario. Um, so for it to, to see a rally, the 200 period EMA will be the first resistance point where the market is going to hit, uh, assuming if it's going to, uh, you know, to, uh, going to be seeing a rally. Uh, again, if it does break that, that means there's a change in trend. So that's how you know we use a 200 period EMA uh, line to differentiate whether the market is on the uptrend or a downtrend. Now, um, the reason besides looking at the trend, besides identifying and establishing the trend, it's also important for us to look at the strength of the trend. And one way to do that is to use an ADX indicator, uh, average directional index stands it stands for ADX. Um, so whenever ADX reading is high that tells you generally the market is trending. Um, if it's a low reading on ADX, that tells you generally the market is sideways market. So if you are doing sideways market, you need to have a different set of strategy. So what I'm sharing with you here today is purely mainly on trend trading. Um, so as long as there's a trend in the market, right with the trend. Uh, one way to look at it, once you establish whether the market is downtrend or uptrend, look at the ADX. As long as the ADX number is trading above 20, that tells you there's trend, there's still strength in the trend, and you should write with the trend. So there's a couple of examples here. So if you look at it, this uh, ADX value, it went from 20, it went higher. And during this time, there's a downtrend in the market. So that tells you the downtrend in the market has a bit of momentum. And true enough, there's until momentum until it peak around here. So when ADX starts to peak and starts to decline, that's where you need to be careful. That means whatever trend that you're riding on, it may come to uh, the momentum of it may, may actually diminish and that's where you know you, you should be getting out of position or you should be more careful in establishing where you should be getting out. Now just, if I just to show you A and B, exhibit A and B uh, and just to ask you this question, uh, if you just look at these two charts A and B, uh, which, which is a better chart for you to indicate uptrend and downtrend in the market? Um, so obviously if you just look at it, it's actually quite similar but you look at A itself, the series of green and red candles are very compact in a sense that if it's a downtrend, it's clearly quite evident. If you compare to B, you have a lot of green and red series side by side. So sometimes you're not sure whether the market is downtrend or uptrend. So one way of looking at it is uh, we, I always use a Haken Ashi candles as one type of Japanese candlesticks, a way to, uh, it's, easier way for you to identify a particular trend at a particular point in time. Um, so the way to use it is that, you know, if you compare A and B, you notice that during there's a series of red and green, um, generally the Haken and will just tell you whether the, the particular bar is red or green. Um, so you don't have to worry, you, know, you don't get, get stopped out of the market that easily because um, if the market is, uh, is indicating a downtrend, it's highlighted by a red candle bar. So if you are still shorting the market, you should still hold on to the short position until you come to a point where the color of the candle starts to change. And that's where you really need to be careful. Um, so one way to use taken actually, if you see green candles, that tells you the market journey is on the uptrend. If you see red candles, that journey tells you the market is on the downtrend. Uh, and if you have a white body candle, 
uh, that tells you the momentum of the trend is very aggressive. Um, so you know that's that's how you use Haken actually as a way to do trend trading. Um, you know, one downside of using Haken actually as compared to Japan's candlestick is that you don't have gaps. They cover up the gaps by the calculation of the candles itself. Um, Japan's candlestick has gaps. So if you are someone that's using gap or you, you use gap trading uh, strategy, um, Haken actually may not be suitable. So that's where you really need to be careful whenever you use Haken actually uh, as compared to Japan's candlesticks. But for trend trading, Haken actually uh, seems to fit a better profile. Now, um, so this is, I got it just, uh, I think last night or the day before. Um, again, I think the 200 period EMA it right now seems to be retest again. Uh, if it breaks, that means the market is still looking at a downtrend. Uh, and we just look at how the market reacted here. Um, you know, really, I think this rally they are saying is, could be just a bear market rally uh, that eventually the market will hit lower. So this is something to really watch out for uh, going forward. Now, um, I just want to draw this example. I think it's quite interesting in a sense that if you just look at it, um, the box candles here is just to highlight if you look at, if you just draw comparison, historical perspective, every third Friday of the month, uh, you notice that the market uh, index itself tends to display uh, quite a negative trend on that particular day. Um, now, not all months are like that. There are certain months that it's not, but it, historically speaking, there's more months where the third Friday of the month itself, uh, you tend to notice that the market tends to be a bit, uh, you know, a, a bit weaker. Now, why is it so? Uh, there's a lot of theory that explain this. I think one of it, the major narrative is a lot of these options that's on US stock markets, it expired on third Friday. Um, so once all these fund managers who bought into the stock options, they have to liquidate or have to recover their option strategy. So one way is that we have to sell the stock market uh, or the particular stock in the open market. So therefore, I think it, it actually bring down the whole index. Um, so again, I think this, these are some classic examples on how uh, just by observing and by looking at the patterns, uh, you can create a bit of a synergy there. But again, these are all historical perspective. Whether this coming third Friday or the next month third Friday will it happen as so, as such, is is again much to be seen. But it gives you a bit of tool and guide uh, when it comes to trading on the third uh, Friday of the month. Now, um, I not only use Haken actually, I have to incorporate that with uh, wing average cost overs. Um, so what I have here is to compare the shorter term and the longer term. The shorter term is uh, comprised of nine period EMA. Longer term is 20 period EME. So if you combine that with Haken actually, it gives you a better signal. Um, so how do you use moving average cost over is that very simple. If you have a bearish cost over, which means that the shorter term crossing below the longer term, that means it's a bearish scenario. And we see a red Haken actually, that means generally the market is going to go down. Um, and again, by how it works on a 200, 200 period EME, the EME lines can also act as a support and resistance level. So as long as the candles doesn't break the longer term uh, EME, that tells you the trend is still intact. But obviously, when the candle starts to break above the longer term period EMA, uh, that means you know, generally the market is going to be breaking up the uptrend. So last but not least, um, you know, despite having the strategy, the trend trading strategy by using Haken Ashi and using the Boeing average crossover, it's important for you to establish uh, the risk management setup. Now, um, one good indicator that I always use to manage risk is to look at average true range. Uh, average true range seek to measure the range of the body of a particular uh, product itself. So you just look at this on the Dow Jones itself. Uh, you know, can you imagine the single day ATR value hit as high as 1,800 points uh, on a single day print? This was happened back in the peak of the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so then really, I think you start to see the volatility of the day has actually reduced. Um, now, why is this important is that ATR doesn't only seek them to measure volatility, it also seeks to measure the way for you to manage risk. Um, how you do that? So I'm just going to give you some examples. Um, so example here is that you can clearly see, this is on micro A mini down, and this, the bottom panel is your ATR value. Uh, and it all changes, uh, as you change your time frame, the ATR value will also be changing. So it depends on what time frame you're looking at. So in this example here is that you can clearly see there's a bearish crossover. You have the shorter term crossing below the longer term and you have a red Haken energy bar. Um, so it's a quite a good entry for you to take a short position. So assuming you take a short position at 33,700 uh, and your ATR rate is 120, 
Um, now, your target profit is 33,460. How do I get that? It's simple. The ATI is 120. Um, so you want to work a reward to risk ratio. That means you'll be, if you, if, um, you want to take um, two to one, so that means you're willing to take 240 points. Uh, and your stop loss is at 33,820, which is 120 points above uh, your entry price. So that's how you manage uh, your reward to risk ratio by looking at your ATR value. Um, obviously, the market changes. If the market gets more volatile, ATR value will increase. Once ATR value increase, that means your risk, uh, your risk total risk exposure is going to be bigger. So that's where you need really need to be comfortable with. If you are someone that's not comfortable with, uh, then ATR may not be a good risk uh, uh, management tool for you. You may use or you may opt for a different type of tools altogether. Uh, but it's a good place to start. I think ATR is a very good uh, way to manage your risk because if you set too tight of a stop loss or too wide of a stop loss, uh, you tend you sometimes you can get stopped out quite often. So that's where you really need to be comfortable with, uh, with your risk to reward profile. Um, so coming to the end, um, these are some of the suits of uh, micro e minis that you can trade. Uh, I believe you can speak to Kananga Futures representative. They'll be more than happy to share with you more details about the product. Um, now, as a start, uh, micros are very uh, easy product to trade in a sense that, um, I would say easier, not easy, easier in a sense that the margins required for trading micros are much cheaper compared to trading uh, the, bigger, the bigger contract itself. Um, when your margins are, are, are lesser, that means the burden on you as a trader uh, you, you don't face that kind of, of uh, too much of a risk. Um, so it's a good place to start. If you want to get exposure in the US market, uh, look at a micros contract. Uh, it does give you a lot of exposure uh, you know, on the different type of benchmark uh, that's available on the CME platform. Now, um, obviously, you know, one uh, key question that I always get this is that, you know, how about a volume? Is the volume substantial enough? You just look at the micro e-mini futures uh, that's being launched back in uh, Third quarter 2019, uh, the volume itself has been, actually been tremendous. Uh, if you just look at how the total um, micro e mini contracts is uh, actually trading on the average daily basis, it's actually more than a million contract. Um, so, like I mentioned, the NASDAQ is, is quite a good product. A lot of people are trading on micro NASDAQ because of the volatility of the market. I shown you earlier the NASDAQ benchmark itself is actually more volatile compared to other US benchmarks. Uh, and I think the second is the SP. Um, so these two are some of the products that actually witness a lot of volume on a daily basis. Uh, but then again, I think averagely, these contracts are trading more than a million uh, on a daily basis. So there's no issue of liquidity. Um, there's no problem for you to get in and out. Uh, and obviously, I think it's a, it's a very good contract to start with. Uh, regarding to margins, I can obviously, you can always keep in touch with Kananga Futures. Um, they, they would have the latest margin for you. They'll update you on the latest margin. Um, so with that, I'm just going to end here. Thank you everyone for your time here today. We hope you actually enjoyed the virtual trading session and you have benefited from this session as well. So once again, I um, believe uh, what you have learned, heard from um, our speaker today, David, would help to uh, give you a better understanding and insight of the products or contracts offered by us. Take the opportunity and trade. Um, in our latest campaign to earn up to 28% cash back till end of this October. So we look forward to see you again. For any inquiries or any questions, feel, please drop us an email at the screen, uh, the contact details shown at the screen and looking forward to see you again in our next upcoming session. Thank you very much and we see you. Good night. What are you clicking? Click kanangafutures.com.my, Malaysia's leading derivatives broker.